So hello everyone and welcome to a new session of our 50 plus shades of Gothic conference. Uh, we are having today the panel on cyber posthumanism and techno Gothic, which is part of our automata cyber terror and technocratic realities section. And I'll begin by reminding everyone to keep your microphones and cameras off while we're speaking so we don't have any weird background noise. And we will have the Q&A session at the end and hopefully a little bit of discussion among our panelists. And so I will already introduce our first two speaker today, who is Paul Mitchell. He teaches in the English department at the Universidad Católica de Valencia San Vicente Martir in Spain. And his current research projects focus on Gothic and posthumanism, particularly in relation to depictions of otherness, monstrosity and disability. So, Paul. Thank you. So, I'll share my screen. One second. Well, thanks, Laura, for your introduction. And uh, thanks also to Potmec for inviting me to talk today about the TV series Electric Dreams. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, it was first broadcast on Amazon Prime in the UK in 2017 and in the US in 2018. And today I'm going to discuss how Electric Dreams illustrates what myself and Amaya Fernandez refer to as the post-human techno-gothic. And in the paper that follows mine, Amaya will explain a little bit more about the post-human aspect of this idea. But first off, I'm going to propose uh, a version of what Catherine Hales calls cyborg reading practices. And that's a reading that prioritizes entanglements and con connectivity, perhaps even confusion over clarity. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how Electric Dreams unsettles some of the ideological boundaries that exist to delimit bodies, identities and genre. Now, the title of the series is actually Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, and each of the 10 episodes are based upon different short stories that Dick wrote in the 1950s. Each of the episodes were written and created by different directors. And while I think the use of Dick's name in the title is a clear uh, marketing strategy to capture the attention of, of sci-fi fans, I think it's also more than that because Electric Dreams repeatedly presents a series of fusions and displacements, which are very interesting. So, for example, in uh, one of Dick's stories, we have a, a male academic who, in Electric Dreams, becomes a lesbian police officer. The USA becomes the UK. Um, and also, as you can see on the screen, in one episode, we get this human pig hybrid uh, who's called Sue. Now, um, what I want to argue is that these are, I think, deliberate misreadings of Dick's stories. And this strategy of, of misreading, I think, is very interesting because it, it interrogates the porous interface that exists between the human and the technological. Now, I'm sure some of you are already perhaps familiar with Roger Luckhurst's concept of zones which he describes as liminal spaces that remark on their own dissolution. And here Dick is thinking uh, specifically about geographical places. But what I'd like to propose is that we see the TV series as an intertextual zone. So it's a zone in which genre itself becomes um, hybridized and confused. And it's for that reason that I've uh, referred in the title of the talk to the techno-gothic, because I think the techno-gothic is an amalgamation of sci-fi's interest in technology with the gothic's long-standing exploration of otherness. So the techno-gothic is a very specific intertextualization of gothic science fiction. And I think this encapsulates very nicely what Rosie Bridotti calls a complex singularity. So Electric Dreams, is a singular TV series, but it's multiple episodes overlap and become entangled with each other. And also, of course, with Dick's original short stories. Now to put that another way, I think we can see Electric Dreams as a hauntology, a spectral trace from the past 
that permeates the present. And so while there are no actual ghosts in the TV series, on a textual level, Philip K. Dick's literary body becomes a textual specter that haunts the Gothic imaginary of electric dreams. Now, in order to kind of explain that idea a little bit further, I'm going to give uh, a specific example. Impossible Planet was um, created by the British director, David Farr, and it was the second episode in the series. And like uh, Philip K. Dick's 1953 story, The Impossible Planet, it's about a wealthy and very old woman, Irma Gordon, who wants to travel to Earth the planet on which her grandparents used to live. Now, in, in Dick's story, Irma is 350 years old. And for some reason, in, in, uh, in the, the David Farr version, she's 242 years old. Now, if anyone can explain that difference to me, I'd be very interested to hear it. But the important thing really is that she's still very old, okay? And so it's clear that her longevity is the result of human technological progress. And yet, despite that, she's deaf. And according to her robot assistant, she also has a fatal heart condition. Now, I'm not sure how much we can trust the robot assistant because throughout the episode, he tells several lies. But the key thing is that Irma pays the space crew from uh, the spaceship Astral Dreams to take her on a journey to Earth. In theory, I think the idea is that she's going there before her inevitable death. But it seems that Irma doesn't know what the space crew knows and what we learn, that actually Earth is now sterile and abandoned. It's an almost forgotten outpost of ancient human civilization. And so instead of going there, the spaceship is actually heading for M43, which is a closer planet that looks almost exactly like Earth. So if you like, we can think of M43 as a kind of astral doppelganger. And the space crew are hoping that Irma won't realize she's been fooled before she dies. But actually, Irma is also fooling them because her real plan is to go to Elk River Falls, a natural beauty spot in Carolina, which, according to family legend, her grandparents used to go skipping, uh, skinny dipping there. Now, one of the most gothic elements of Impossible, uh, Impossible Planet, which is not in Dick's original story, is the sexual attraction between Irma and Norton, the much younger space captain, who looks exactly like her grandfather. And so Norton himself is, is another doppelganger. Irma's incestuous desire for Norton firmly pushes against the boundaries of how third age sexuality is usually represented on television. And there's definitely something very vampiric about Irma, a figuratively undead 342 year old who at one point seduces Norton into dressing up in the clothes that her grandfather used to wear. And Norton is seduced. He abandons his girlfriend and their plans for professional and social success and he decides instead to follow Irma onto the surface of M43. And it's there that they die together. Starved of oxygen in the poisonous air, they experience a shared hallucination in which they swim in the river, uh, in the water, sorry, at Elk River. And it's represented to us as a very blissful way for them to die. Now, I think this aspect of, of the story resonates particularly well with Braidotti's uh, theory of post-human death. Braidotti says that what we must truly desire is to surrender the self, preferably in the agony of ecstasy, thus choosing our own way of disappearing. But rather than death being represented here as an absence, Irma and Norton's disappearance is depicted as what Braidotti calls a generative flow of becoming. So they sacrifice their individual human selves to become interrelational energy, an energy that embeds them within the larger universe. So not only do they submerge their bodies into the landscape at Elk River, but they also go a posthuman or Gothic fusion with the spectral characters of Irma's grandparents, 
whose clothing they both put on and then later take off. And that's why I think um, the use of intercutting in the episode is so important because stylistically it creates a sense of this fusion. Throughout the episode, we see sporadic visions of Irma's grandparents and we're encouraged to read these as being flashbacks, spectral moments of history that are embedded in the present. But increasingly, their status becomes much more problematic. Are they really from the past or are they actually flash forwards to the shared hallucination that Irma and Norton will experience just before they die? Now, through this ambiguity, I think Impossible Planet uses television to create a sense of telethesia, a polytemporality where the past, present and the future become fused into one. Time is no longer linear, but a continuum, an endless flow of existence that exceeds the individual. Now, in Farr's adaptation, Norton is the person who dies alongside Irma. But in Dick's original story, it was her robot assistant. And this suicide pact has been criticized by several online reviewers. As you can see on the screen, Louisa Mella has said that the ending doesn't really stack up, while uh, Brian Robb has called it a cop out. But I think it helps a lot if we see the episode in terms of post humanism. Dissatisfied with the priorities of late capitalism that obsess his girlfriend. Norton comes to realize the need for an existence that is more profoundly ecological. And this is illustrated symbolically when he gives up his share of the money that Irma has paid for her journey into space. So in doing so, he swaps capitalism for what Braidotti calls vitalist materialism, a radical imminence that is beyond individual death. Now, of course, the blissful hallucination that Norton shares with Irma is totally irrational. After all, how can two people have exactly the same mental vision? But this fusion, I think, is very important because it displaces our cultural obsession with binaries, that humanist paradigm that separates life from death, the inside from the outside, and self from other. So when Mala says it doesn't really stack up, I think that's exactly the point. Death here is not transcendental or hierarchical. It's an ending that doesn't really have an end. Death is here depicted as an ecological fusion on a galactic scale. And so by not dying on Earth, which happens in Dick's story, by the way, Norton's and Irma's entanglement is a shift away from the individual and the human towards the universal. So it becomes a form of um, dislocation, one that can be profitably viewed, I think, in terms of the eco-Gothic. Now, for David Del Principe, this is an inclusive lens, a site of articulation for environmental and species identity. And we can see on the screen that M43's landscape is stylized in very Gothic terms. It's a shadowy world that, in Dick's original story, has been created by human beings' ecological mismanagement. Uh, having had all its natural resources stripped away, the planet has become sterile and uninhabitable. And that contrasts greatly with the verdant idyll that is Elk River Falls, a place where the human becomes part of the natural world and the landscape, not separate from it or dominant over it. So to conclude, in Farr's adaptation, Irma's and Norton's journey to M43 represents a post-humanist view of existence and dying. They are literally deterritorialized, displaced from the earth that has historically grounded human existence. Instead, they become part of space, an infinite cosmos that cannot be categorized or resolved. In short, they're absorbed into a liminal zone where the human is of no more or less significance than anything else that exists in the vast timelessness of the universe. Thank you. This is my uh, bibliography. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Such an interesting presentation and for keeping it very much in time. 
Uh, we're going to move to our next presenter, who is Amaya Fernandez. She lectures on Anglophone literature and cinema at the University of the Basque Country in Spain. She is a researcher in gender, Gothic, and cultural studies. She is currently a member of REWEST, a, re a research group, and she is working together with Dr. Paul Mitchell from UCB. She is also working on a project regarding the representation of the technogothic posthuman in, contemporary, in the contemporary TV series Electric Dreams, which from we just heard about from Paul, and she's gonna continue on that. So Amaya, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen now. I think you should be able to see it now. Sorry, so this is not the slide I was looking for, it's this one. All right. Okay, so technological post-humanity and organic cyborgs in Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams from now on, Electric Dreams. Um, so in today's presentation, I explore three elements that I argue are central to these uh, series. And um, they are technology, the post-human and Gothic. This is so because the analysis I bring you to you today is actually part of a larger project as already mentioned, uh, which I share with Dr. Paul Mitchell, who has just presented um, his take on electric dreams. And, and this project aims to research the extent to which current science fiction series make use of Gothic concepts and conventions such as anxiety, transgression, hybridization, ideological and aesthetic horror, in order to represent the emergence of post-human beings via technology. Now, due to formal limitations, uh, obviously, um, neither of us um, are able, were able to discuss the whole TV series. So this is why Dr. Mitchell has focused on Impossible Planet and I will discuss the episodes Autofac and The Hood Maker, uh, directed respectively by Peter Horton and Julian Gerald and based on the homonymous short stories by Philip K. Dick and those stories were both published in 1955. So let us first concentrate on the term Gothic. As a genre, it hardly requires an introduction, and what little explanation is required in order to set the framework for the specific way in which we understand and apply the term in our project, Dr. Mitchell has already eloquently covered. I will be using the theorization of Gothic conventions with an emphasis on Julia Christopher's seminal work on the abject and Fred Bottom's definition of transgression. And make the case, I will try to make the case that these concepts are used in electric dreams as means to expose the ontological anxieties generated by the transhumanist understanding of the relationship between humanity and technology. In this series, produced by Brian Cranston, Ronald D. Moore and Michael Dinner, and first released in the UK in 2017, abjection and transgression are used to challenge the distinction between human and non-human and to monstrify technology and excessive technophilia. The climactic scene in The Hootmaker is set in a deserted factory, a decayed building, symbol of the ruinous past of technology-based capitalism. After a last devastating world war, surviving societies had destroyed all computing and information technology in an effort to prevent another catastrophic conflict. In artifact, the factory that was designed to produce and distribute anything and everything that humans might ever need or want is still working. A lustrous, impeccable facility operated by the eponymous artificial intelligence in a world in which humans have become extinct after a final nuclear war. Driven by the ontological urge to provide its services, the Autofac become, begins producing its own customers, human-looking cyborgs that are, that are unaware of their artificial origins. Most of these cyber customers live in self-organized rural communities, trying to resist the terrorizing power of the Autofac and its consumeristic dictatorship. They will succeed in defeating and destroying the Autofac when, led by a young woman by the name of Emily, a small guerrilla group manages to infiltrate the factory and implant a virus in the artificial intelligence central system. From the point of view of technological posthumanity, Gothic monstrosity is configured both as the abject that is to be expelled, purged, erased from the collective social cultural space, 
and as the other that is actually constructed as a subaltern, marginal, yet constitutive and useful part of said social space. The transgression of the barriers of social subjugation is interpreted as a transgression of social order and as such as an act of defiance, as a threat, which in turn motivates the, head, um, the hegemonic social cultural discourse to reframe the other as abject. The autofuck objectifies its customers by considering them as a means to fulfill its purpose, to keep the production consumption cycle going. However, it is only when Emily reveals to the autofuck that she is awakened to her cybernetic condition and that she intends to destroy the factory that the AI labels her as dangerous and as a dangerous abnormality as the abject that needs to be expunged. In both episodes, what is left of the world is either dominated by a tyrannical human government, a la 1948, or it recoils in terror from a tyrannical AI machine, a la Terminator. However, while in Autofact the process of redefinition of the human into the post-human results in the digitalization of the human mind into a cybernetic body, in the Hoodmaker, the post-human takes the, shapes, the shape of mutants with organic bodies, but minds that can replace computing technologies and even the internet. In other words, the Hoodmaker and Autofact polarize the, the dichotomies organic, artificial, and human and human by presenting respectively a world in which artificial intelligence, digital information, and computers have ceased to exist, and, oh, on the other hand, a world in which humans have become extinct. So, of course, the premise for this is the existence of a conflict between humanity as we know it and technology as we imagine it in future. Um, in other words, humanity in presentia and technology in potentia. This is represented in both diegetic realities by a literal armed conflict which still lingers on like a ghost in the narratives via external analepsis or visual flashbacks. Technology has traditionally been construed as this subjected other in a vertical relationship between the human hand and the non-human tool. And this is eventually produced, and this eventually has produced a magnified and anthropomorphic version of technology in the collective imaginarium. To imagine and represent technology as a sheer instrument, as a tool subjected to the will of its maker, is problematic if the tool turns out to have self-consciousness and desires, as is the case with the cyborgs in, Aut in Autopark. Even more problematic if the tool turns out to be a woman born as is the case with the exploited and abused mutants in The Hoodmaker. The relationship between humanity and technology becomes a source of gothing anxiety only when the oppositional relationship between the one and the other is presented horizontally rather than vertically. The horizontal polarization of humanity and technology paints technology as an equal, but also as an enemy. And it is the fear of the potential mightiness of this enemy that turns it into a monster in our, in our eyes. As we will see later, not only does this vertical re reorganization of the one other subject of a, uh, sorry, subject object agent tool dichotomies, not only does it trigger gothic anxieties in the characters of the two episodes, but it also offers a sharp critique of the dualist anthropocentric views of identity, reality, and power that certain currents in philosophical and social transhumanism seem to encourage and that have been directly inherited by humanist thinking from humanist thinking. In fact, the question I ask these two texts is whether they could actually espouse a post-humanist understanding of the human non-human continuum. This brings us to the next um, in our research project, the word post-humanity. And in the word post-humanity, my title references the fact that many recent films and TV series imagine humanity mutating into an entirely different form of being. Some science fiction texts envision a future in which consciousness exists past human form, some even past organic embodiment. These texts often follow the transhumanist definition of posthumanity as that which is left after humanity has evolved to the point of having become a different species. Depending on the text, the posthuman, that is to say the construct per se, can be used to criticize transhumanism uh, and so, sorry, transhumanist anthropocentrism and boundless technophilia, or on the contrary, to convey a sense of optimism and eager anticipation around transhumanism views of the future of humanity. 
In the latter case, transhumanist philosophy has hijacked Donna Haraway's cyborg with her composite hybridized body in which the organic, the inorganic, the human and the non-human animal merge. Max Moore's transhumanist philosophy focuses on the human element in Haraway's construct and places it at the center of the post-human creature. In fact, it becomes the essence of the transhumanist post-human, who is not really perceived as a hybrid, but as a human body that has been modified beyond recognition, a human mind that has been augmented, artificially expanded, cognitively improved, and sometimes even severed from the body and transferred to inorganic microchips, computer servers. The transhumanist post-human was once a human body in which limb after limb, organ after organ, all constitutive elements had been replaced with cybernetic uh, equivalents. Or it is a consciousness that once existed in the neural networks of a human brain, but, had, but that has eventually been transferred to an inorganic artificial vessel. The artifact bases the customers it fabricates on the physical appearance and the digitalized, and the digitalized personality of human individuals that are once existed. This passage from organic to partially or fully inorganic existence is represented as transgressive because it constitutes an act of transubstantiation, which turns a transgressor into something other than human from both a chemical and an ontological point of view. However, what is presented as abject for most of the script is the artifact itself, not its children. For the former has deliberately transgressed natural order, while the latter are initially presented to the viewer as fully human, humane, and righteous in their pursuits. Oops, sorry, I have lost. Wait a second. Oh. Yes. Um, Right. The Hoodmaker, on the other hand, presents a very interesting subtype of transhumanist evolution, one in which there has taken place no obvious change in the biological and physiological dimension of the post-human. This is a different type of post-human creature that has spontaneously and organically grown out of the pre-existing human species, and that is clearly other than human. Um, the so-called teeps are mutants whose mental abilities are as superior to those of the Homo sapiens sapiens as the latter's are to those of chimpanzees and gorillas. In the dystopian world of the Hootmaker, the world has been returned to the type of low-tech existence that was typical of the years before the Second World War. And yet, the lack of advanced technology, and in particular of advanced computing tools, digital data storage, and of the internet, has been replaced by the manual labor of these exploited minor minority. The tips. Teeps can read everybody's minds. In fact, they live in the per perpetual chatter of what they call the vine. Unable to disconnect from the network of minds, both human and mutant minds, teeps become an organic version of the internet. They are used to transmit long, -listed, long distance messages, to retrieve all sorts of data, to acquire secret information. They are used in brothels as both objects and as narrators of human pornographic fantasies. They are therefore the emails, the Google, the Trojan software and sex workers of this low tech world. It follows that teeps are useful subaltern others that become abject only when their abilities begin to be perceived as dangerous. It is their eventual revolutionary insurrection that changes the way in which they are perceived by the viewer. The teeps are initially portrayed as pitiful, wounded, harassed victims. The faces bear the marks of their otherness, but they are also beautiful, youthful, tender. The transgression of the boundaries of social order is represented as their transition from other to abject. And in the final scene, teeps have become creepy, disturbing, inhumanly robotic, and potentially as lethal and as sadistic as humans. There exists, however, another way of understanding the posthuman. If we read both episodes through the lenses of Rosie Bredotti's branch of philosophical posthumanism, their anti dualist and anti anthropocentric and anti humanist counter discourse begins to surface. According to Bredotti, the posthuman construct is not in the future and does not result exclusively in the technological from technological manipulation. It is the result of challenging and deconstructing the Vitruvian conceptualization of man as anthropos and the consequent exclusion of defective, deviant, different embodiments thereof from the definition and the rights of human subjects. Philosophical posthumanism redefines subjectivity as non-dualistic, relative, and decentralized. 
This is reflected in both episodes in the way in which behind or alongside the conflict between humanity and technology, Gerald and Horton intentionally display other power struggles, i.e. the trodden proletarian masses versus a totalitarian regime in the hood maker and the self-organized re resistance versus a consumeristic dictatorship in Autofact. Viewers are obviously confronted with capitalist and imperialist exploitation in the way in which the autofact perceives its customers as mere cogs in the consumeristic machine, and the way in which the experiments on mutant children and the abuse of adult mutants' bodies and minds are reminiscent of Nazi eugenics in The Hoodmaker. In the latter, humans are portrayed as dishonest, cruel, manipulative. The society that they have raised from the ashes of the previous self-destructive civilization is a faceless, ruthless, totalitarian regime that abuses the rights of both humans and thieves. In autofact, humans are also greedy, destructive to the point of being responsible for their own extinction and for creating the monstrous AI that antagonizes the focalizers with whom the spectator identifies. This deliberate insistence on human sins portrays humanity itself as abject for transgressing moral order. The focalization of the narrative through the eyes of a naive, courageous and noble young deep, aptly named Anna, is designed to shift the allegiance of the spectator from the human characters to the non-human mutants. Yet, the viewer is forced to constantly readjust their perception and moral judgment of both humans and mutant, as Anna uncovers the truth about the motivations, intentions and potential for cruelty and destruction in both species. The same happens in Autofact, when a final twist in the plot uncovers Emily's former identity as, as a human, she is the cybernetic reincarnation of the woman who designed and built the artifact. When she destroys her monstrous creature, her behavior is not dissimilar to that of Beck Victor Frankenstein. Furthermore, since Emily, the self-conscious cyborg, chooses to terminate some forms of artificial intelligence, the artifact and those cyborgs that were directly employed by it she, but, but she saves herself, on the other hand, and those human-like cyborgs that she says she loves, the question rises whether this is anything but yet another transgression of modern boundaries. Humans use and abuse humans and non-humans alike, and so do cyborgs and mutants. In the last scene of The Hoodmaker, Anna is left to choose whether to side with the mutant revolution or to save the human that she's in love with but who has betrayed her. Although the ending of both episodes might seem cynically hinting at a hopeless future for both humans and post-humans, the relevance given to the destructiveness of hierarchical social order and of vertical relationships rather suggests that both texts criticize the monstrous excess of power and control exerted by centralized systems, and particularly when they are invested with the power of defining citizenship, personhood, and subjectivity. In conclusion, while in Autofact and the Hoodmaker, the deep structure um, seems to support a transhumanist conceptualization of the posthuman, the narrative structure and discursive construction can be read as posthumanist in that they contradict transhumanist conceptualizations of the abuse of technology, they question dualist configurations of the posthuman, and they challenge an anthropocentric understanding of the monstrous other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amaya, for such a nice follow-up to Paul's presentation. And we are going to move now to something a bit different with our next panelist, Alejandro Rivero Vadillo. He is currently a PhD candidate in American Studies at Instituto Franklin at Universidad de Alcalá in Madrid, Spain. His research focuses on the intersection between environmental humanities, cyberpunk fiction, an accelerationist theory in the context of contemporary science fiction literature, film, and arts. So whenever you... Oh, just wait a second. I'm trying to figure out how to move this. Oh, yeah, great. Okay, so oh, thank you so much, Laura, and also thank you to the, well, to the BACMEC team for accepting my, my proposal. Uh, as you can read on the screen, Today, I will talk about Gothic Sinotemporalities in Reza Nagaristani's Skills Till for and Robin McKay's uh, comic book Chronosis. Um, before starting, I need to, um, to point out um, a small change in terms of focus for this presentation. So, what I, I submitted a proposal to analyze all the Gothic or most of the Gothic elements in, the, so in this comic book. But uh, what I will be doing, because I think it's actually far more interesting, is to compare the way in which the Gothic master 
that we uh, that we see in in chronosis, uh, represents uh, a shift in in thematic terms um, regarding how accelerationist theory fiction has normally portrayed the gothic or the cyber gothic uh, monster. So um, chronosis, uh, what is chronosis? This is a, a very good question. Um, Chronosis is a comic book that was recently published by Urbanomic, which is a, a publishing house that is characterized uh, by their theory fiction publications and also their acceler accelerationist uh, sort of uh, publications uh, in the form of, uh, of essays, basically. So this is this comic that they that they published recently is something uh, quite experimental that mixes theory fiction from, again, from, a, from an accelerationist, uh, highly theoretical perspective, uh, mixes it with, uh, with the traditional American comic format. Um, so most of those of these highly theoretical um, concepts that are explored in the, in the comic are, um, well, I, are seen through visuals rather than uh, through, uh, through words. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what accelerationism uh, or, or theory fiction um, are, uh, basically accelerationism is this current of thought, this philosophy that was born during the 90s, sort of, uh, even though it, we, can, we can trace it back to Marx. And it basically describes uh, capitalism as, you know, as, as this form uh, this monstrous uh, alien form that um, is well accelerating and eventually creating uh, a singularity in which, uh, of course, humans are not a part of. Uh, and theory fiction is well this sort of narratives that um, intermingle uh, highly theoretical theoretical thought and and fiction, particularly uh, Lovecraftian fiction. So the authors of this uh, of this comic book are Brisson Garistani, Robin McKay, and Keith Tilford. Although Negarstani wrote most of the well of the plot of the narrative, and and Tilford illustrated it, but the three of them are philosophers, and this clearly shows the intention uh, that the editors had with this with this comic book, which was to explore. Uh, philosophy in an experimental way, definitely not to to make uh, this philosophy more um, palatable to the public or or anything like that. So, and anyone who has uh, who has read the comic definitely uh, will definitely see that because uh, the, the the thematic components are um, are quite obscure sometimes if you are not familiar with with the field. So. What happens in chronosis? Uh, that is also a very interesting question, uh, mainly because um, nothing happens. Basically, is our, uh, most of the of the text is uh, is theoretical reflection with with visuals. So I have taken uh, the summary provided by Urbanomic uh, that definitely summarizes it better than than what I could have ever done. Uh, basically, um, they say that um, chronosis is about uh, stuck in the multiverse, a strange entity uh, manifests itself in different guises, visiting trauma upon whoever encounters it, whether Jeremy Charles, Erdogan Hawker of Paranoid Cosmic Visions, or the Interplanetary Order of the Lackers, intent on extending their galactic empire to planet Earth. This is the figure of time itself, with whose birth the story of Chronosis begins. And I will also say that it also ends. Uh, the aesthetic order of the Mona Saints, uh, who dwell nowhere and no one, are the only ones to have mastered time, attempting to build bridges between the many fragmented tribes and histories of multiple possible worlds. Uh, this actually says far more than the actual plot of the, uh, of the comic book, um, but uh, there is uh, the, the Gothic element that we see here is that time is going to be, uh, well, the primary protagonist in this narrative, we follow time, the spirit of time through different races, through different moments of time, through different planets, uh, reflecting on their, uh, on you know, these peoples, this uh, species, conceptualization of time and ways of, uh, of avoiding time, of, of liberating uh, existentially 
uh, from, from the time crisis. And actually, uh, chronosis uh, literally means the infection of time. Um, so to clearly or to uh, better contextualize how these uh, the cyber gothic elements work in the monster, in time, in, in chronosis, I think we need to uh, very briefly um, well, summarize what has been done in the past in the field of accelerationist uh, theory fiction. It started with, uh, well, with the writings uh, of the CCRU, uh, which were uh, a group of professors of scholars at the University of Warwick during the 90s that started developing this, uh, well, this accelerationist thought, but also combining it with, uh, with elements that are quite representative of the Lovecraftian Gothic. We will see them in a minute. And this list is just for you to, to see that there is a whole, um, a whole uh, framework or a whole background of, of stories, of narratives, uh, uh, of theory fiction. And these are just uh, some examples, but if, if you Google that on the internet, uh, you will find uh, thousands and thousands of books, uh, or at least of essays. Uh, dealing with uh, with theory fiction and and exploring theory fiction as a way to to talk about accelerationism. But how is uh, the accelerationist monster? How has uh, has it been conceptualized in the past, particularly by authors such as uh, Nick Land, who is probably the, the the father of the accelerationist movement? Well, we see that uh, capitalism. Uh, doesn't work as a gothic, as a classical gothic monster. It is not a vampire, as it has uh, sometimes been conceptualized, but more as a shogoth. Uh, I don't even know if I pronounced this name properly. Uh, shogoth uh, or a Cthulhu uh, from the Lovecraftian folklore, uh, and basically, uh, capitalism is seen as an alien entity, as an alien virus that came into the earth. Uh, after the Middle Ages or during the Middle Ages, uh, that uh, started infecting uh, the whole world, the whole society in, well, economically, right? So in, in capitalist terms, and also in, in technological terms. And their purpose is to shape itself into existence. So to create, uh, to, to give birth to itself, to a singularity that eventually will uh, eradicate all human life or uh, anything that we that we could consider human uh, at all. So uh, basically, uh, humans cannot resist this monster. Uh, it's not like a vampire that can be killed or uh, like a Frankenstein. It cannot be defeated uh, at all. And I would like to recover this this quote by by Nick Land in his famous essay Meltdown, in which he says that. Uh, after the singularity, after capitalism has been uh, or gives birth to, to himself or to itself, nothing human makes it out of the near future. And, and most importantly, um, this monster uh, has no body, no shape, and no central node. This capitalist monster works in the Illusion and Waterian ways uh, or rhizomatic ways. Uh, and therefore cannot be, uh, cannot be killed. Now, this is not really the monster we see in Chronosis. Uh, this is not really the Gothic understanding of the monster that we see in this comic book. Uh, this is, uh, now you're seeing the, the monster in black and white uh, in the comic. The comic is actually uh, in color, but I don't want to commit any any uh, copyright crime. So I am I am using uh, what Urbanomic kindly has kindly provided to to well to scholars and to everyone uh, to use in their presentations and, and everything. Uh, so uh, regardless, um, what we see here is a recovery of the anthrop anthropomorphous monster uh, rather than this uh, very obscure, very uh, amorphous monster. What we see here is the classical uh, specter, right? So a hooded image, uh, we even see their, uh, their arms, uh, we see a head. Definitely it, it looks like a cosmic ghost, sort of. 
So it, Ringaristani is recovering here this sense of humanism that, by the way, characterizes uh, his own academic writing. But uh, apart from that, Ringaristani uh, is recovering the figure of the undead uh, as a source of horror. Uh, time is seen by humans and by uh, the lesser man as, the, as a source of horror, of course, and because uh, it advances uh, their own death, but time itself uh, is conceived as, as eternal, is conceived uh, not in linear terms, but in, in, in more uh, cyclic hours or, or, or round terms, which of course, uh, can be linked to the eternity that the figure of the undead normally uh, normally bears uh, per se, right? Now, another thing that is interesting in the way uh, this this gothic monster is conceptualized is that um, it feeds on capitalism or and technological progress from other races. So all along the narrative, we see that the way in which this monster, uh, this accelerationist monster gives birth to itself is through, uh, is through capitalism or what we might call capitalism uh, in human ways. So all this uh, technological progress, uh, vital uh, economical progress, right? Which is interesting because normally in, in accelerationist theory fiction, uh, it happens the other way. So normally, uh, as defined by Nick Land, for instance, in, in his famous essay, uh, Teleoplexy, uh, capitalism feeds on time uh, to build to, or to construct uh, itself. But again, this is perhaps uh, Negristani trying to answer to, to Nick Land, who, by the way, is uh, an ideological sort of enemy. And um, also, uh, the monster, uh, this, this specter that we see here, is a recent subject. Uh, the accelerationist monster, gothic monster, is not characterized by its, um, its ability to speak in human ways or to be understood in human ways. But what this monster is trying, even though we see that uh, humanity and the lizard man fear, uh, fear it, uh, is trying to be or, or, or to have some, some sort of uh, current of thought that we as readers can understand. This is why we follow him or it uh, through the whole narrative. Again, trying to explain uh, different ways of understanding time to come to terms to its mere presence. And, and also uh, the, the final difference with this monster is that uh, it is willing to integrate humanity in its uh, temporal material space. If the accelerationist monster tries to, or eventually, uh, inevitably, um, will consume humanity or anything that is uh, that is represented by humanity, this monster, uh, or, or so sort of pseudo monster, because as for the reader, it is not a monster, um, definitely tries to make humanity part of this uh, of this evolution of this um, history that is at the same time not history uh, as we see it in the in the in the comic book so um, I think uh, this is one of the most interesting parts of the comic uh, in the original one or in the in the sellable one uh, you will find this scene uh, in color and with different, there are some differences in, in the artwork, but the dialogue is the same. And here we see this these specter haunting this race of, of humanoids. They are not um, reptiles, they are not humans, they are something different, uh, who are, um, well, they're trying to come to terms to, with the notion of time, again, in a very poetical or metaphorical way. And, and here uh, the monster starts to, well, to talk to them, to interact with them in a constructive way, um, creating or eventually liberating them as we will, as we will eventually know. And um, I don't know, do you have time to read a little bit or how much time do I have, Laura? 
just what okay then <laughs> okay i will come to the conclusion now so basically uh criminosis represents the incorporation of the of classical gothic elements into uh, accelerationist theory fiction and it, and it changed uh what we the traditional approach in this genre to this monster uh this monster that again is not substituted by a reinterpretation of the classical the classical gothic monster uh but a combination of both and and the interesting part as well is that uh it also changes the the patterns through which accelerationism has normally been analyzed so instead of, instead of this deterministic uh approach to acceleration we see uh that uh, there is a future for humanity once uh it comes to terms to his own or to their own um well to their own end or to their own place in time so thank you so much um this is the bibliography i have used and um yeah you have any questions or anything please uh, ask me thank you so much thank you alejandro for your very interesting analysis of the comic and so we are gonna move on to our q a section for the panel so if anyone has a question you can do it by raising your hand in the reactions button at the bottom of your screens or writing in the chat if you don't want to appear on camera or speak paul hi yeah i've um, i've got a couple of questions actually for for alex um uh, the the first one I think is is um, is one which I th I think I, I you mentioned a couple of times the singularity okay and yes and the singularity that I know is the 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 technological singularity which is the kind of a concept developed by Werner Vinge and I was wondering is that the same technologically that you're talking about there or 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 in this particular type of fiction is the singularity actually a different concept that that's the first question. Okay, so uh, yes, so uh, it is that at the same time, it is an evolution from that concept. So uh, basically with land arts, again, this is uh, not really fictional, it's more philosophical and metaphysical, uh, but uh, land normally uh, deals with what he calls the techno-economical singularity. So basically, uh, to this idea of the technological singularity that we have seen in in science fiction so um like like skynet for instance um uh, he adds a certain sense of philosophical politics uh, and basically he what he says is well this skynet uh if you add the economical uh, an, an economical um sphere to the notion uh, what you get is this techno capitalism that is this Lovecraftian monster that is at the same time the the traditional uh, technological singularity. Okay. I don't know if that's... this answers to your question. Yeah, there. no, it does actually, and that's quite interesting because the other thing I was thinking about and that I wanted to ask you about was while you were talking um, and you were mentioning kind of you know that these these texts are very critical of of capitalism and that as you said they kind of add to the technological singularity, this kind of economic dimension. I was just wondering if you've considered kind of um, basing your reading or, or um, expanding your reading into critical posthumanism, because it seems to me that the things that Braidotti is saying, which kind of um, both myself and, and Amaya referenced in our talks is, is particularly relevant, I think, in the sense in which yes. you know, critical posthumanism is very anti, not anti-capitalism, but a way of kind of exploring the, the kind of the, the implications of capitalism, you know, um, and it does seem to me a potentially relevant framework for you. It is actually, uh, uh, it's not just a potential uh, relevant framework, but one that I also use, and uh, it can be, let's say, the accelerationism or accelerationism, um, even though it is uh, an incredibly wide sort of philosophy, uh, it, it definitely, you have Nick Land, who, who is uh, actually uh, a far right apologist, actually. Uh, and you have also uh, uh, left uh, accelerationism, but you also have 
um, a sort of accelerationism that deals with these post-human issues. And in fact, when I read um, when I read Bright Audi or when I read um, Donna Haraway, for instance, the the later works of Donna Haraway, I see that they are talking about the same issues as these uh, continental philosophers, although perhaps in a more understandable way, which is great. Uh, um, so yes, definitely, they are interrelated in so many ways. Uh, and in fact, this is actually, I, I tend to uh, explore whenever I, 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 do my, I do my research. Because okay. the way in which I conceptualize posthumanism uh, in relation to, to accelerationism, uh, because accelerationism is descriptive, is uh, more, it's not really a political uh, or even an ontological approach, uh, but a definition of a process, the process of capitalism. And posthumanism feels, or at least to me, it feels that posthumanism is what might solve or might help to solve uh, the problem in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. So, thanks for your answer, Alex. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for the question. So we have another question from Anna. Yes, I also have a question for you. Um, so I read the comic. So I was wondering, as um, in the end, you didn't have that much time to go actually into the comic itself. Um, I was wondering, in general, these um, these authors that you've been mentioning, uh, what is the kind of aesthetics they connect to? Is there um, general uh, theory fiction uh, aesthetics? Uh, because if I see the comic, I wouldn't say it, it has any uh, specific, different, um, never seen before uh, kind of aesthetics, but maybe there is some elements. There are some elements that are connected to the to the theory that's behind it, and I cannot tell it because I don't know basically nothing well. <laughs> about, you know, but I was also thinking uh, of uh, Armand's vampire that you uh, mentioned. And when I see that, uh, what I feel, I don't know, it reminds me of futurism. And I say it reminds me of futurism because I'll be honest, it's the avant-garde I know best because, you know, Italian. Uh, so is there some, some kind of uh, common thread aesthetically, or I don't know, are there some elements that you can say are connected, graphic elements? Well, there are two issues here. So I don't think uh, uh, the editors and, and the authors tried or attempted to be innovative. Uh, in Vampire uh, by Armand, uh, Armand tried to be innovative, and that's, uh, I don't know if you have read it, uh, I think you have, um, but it's definitely an avant-garde sort of uh, aesthetics mixed with, um, with uh, well, with theory fiction. Uh, but here they, they did not attempt it to create uh, an, in an, a sense of innovative Gothic aesthetics uh, in their visuals. Uh, actually, they use the well traditional um, American style comic uh, aesthetics. So sometimes even it feels like it, it's a superhero sort of um, comic. Um, but they didn't even, they didn't try to or they didn't they didn't attempt it to create something innovative. They wanted to use that uh, specific space in pop culture to talk about this highly complicated or highly not complicated, but theoretical issues uh, and try to answer to some, some uh, more, uh, I guess, metaphysical questions of the genre itself, of, of theory fiction itself, because theory fiction normally does not escape the boundaries of essays, of the written text. 
And one of the issues with accelerationism or the, or the maximal points of accelerationism is that uh, eventually it all tends, uh, so acceleration or the singularity tends to be, uh, or tends to reduce essence to zero. This, this is a very metaphysical thing and probably it doesn't mean anything in practical terms, but this is what they, what these philosophers define when they deal with this sort of philosophy. So they try to apply this notion of, of eradicating boundaries and to level everything to the same level also to the to cultural production. So uh, this is why I think they decided to, to use the comic format, the traditional comic format to escape the boundaries of, of categories, actually, of theory fiction categories. This is a super long uh, answer. I don't know if I, uh, if I answered anything, uh, what you asked, but- uh... No, yeah, it's, I, th I thought it, that that was interesting as, um, you know, sometimes you can, you can have an innovative comic without doing too much, without changing too much. It's just, it's very easy. Uh, to to take advantage of the medium to convey um, stuff that is complicated or stuff uh, that needs I don't know to elicit some feelings in a way you know elicit something like I think this narrative uh, could have I don't know could have benefited from from a little bit more um, yes and at the same time. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And, and in fact, what you see with, uh, with uh, Vampire, to, to keep with, with this example, is a different, this is more about the economics of uh, having a publishing house on continental philosophy. Uh, in the case of Vampire, it is published through um, an open source, um, mm. a volunteering sort of, um, publishing house, so they are, I guess, uh, more free to do what they, what you know, whatever they want in, uh, in aesthetical terms. But Urbanomic sells uh, their books, and um, to start with a comic and to be the first ones in selling comics about theory fiction or mm -hmm. building on theory fiction, um, I guess it is a challenge in economical terms. In, in you need to sell the, the the book and even from my own personal perspective because i was or i don't know if i'm still on in a project of uh creating a comic book uh or a theory fiction comic book it is hard uh it is really hard to to finally publish that because there are so many risks um and you know, these people in the end, uh, they want to sell their product and they yeah, want so maybe to profit. Yeah. They want to profit yeah. from the product, so they come to more traditional forms uh, in order to to make the well to make the text more appealable to to an audience. Yeah, a bit of a commercial compromise. Yes. yes. Well, yeah, uh, I, I was just uh, curious because I thought that as the narrative was so, um, you know, connected to this kind of theory, um, I found the, the visuals and, and the graphic part quite... Yeah, I, I need to confess that I was also disappointed by that. I expected, I expected uh, uh, something, something more experimental in terms of visuals, but um, still it's, it's interesting what they, what they are doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So since we don't have at the moment any more questions for the public, I'm going to post a question to our panelists, myself, and I think I think you can all come into this one. Um, something that I was very interested when when we when we decided to have a section for eco gothic and a different section for cyber gothic. What I've noticed from the beginning, since we were interviewing our keynotes and in other panels is that there is a somehow a very interesting connection between this kind of going toward technology or going toward nature or when the na the monster is situated in nature say the forest is like dark and gothic and scary 
or the Gothic is situated in the technology, as do many of you have explained. And I think Paul specifically mentioned the eco Gothic, and and all of you kind of dealt a little bit um, with this issue with with the human nature and how the human evolves or trans transcends some kind of um, name or human nature, maybe going to this post-humanist and transhumanist theories that you've been speaking about. And also Alejandro spoke of, of how this monster in the comic is kind of willing to integrate humanity in, the, in his monstrosity or something along these lines. So I was wondering, how do you feel about this, this connection between the eco-Gothic and, and the, the cyber-Gothic? Where do they, are they the same or they are, you know, how like opposites kind of, it goes around and it touches each other or how, how do you feel about this? And we can go, if you want, we can go in the same order that you presented, if you all want to okay. come in and comment something. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I was just saying, I think it's a really good question. Um, and I've listened to a few of the, the eco gothic sessions um, and it, it definitely kind of raised issues that, that um, I thought were very interesting as well in terms of the stuff that myself and Amaya are currently researching. And I, th I think, I mean, from my point of view, I kind of see that we are, we are living in or we're at least moving towards post-human times, you know, that I think um, because of the nature of technology now and, and what it can do, that it's created a whole kind of different um consciousness you know a different way of, of perceiving the world which i think is is post-humanist you know and therefore i think one of the things that's come out of the critical post-humanist movement is the way in which it looks at the the kind of ethical implications of of technology and i think therefore fundamentally that's got a very um clear connection to environmental ecological issues you know that it, one of the things that's come out of of critical post-humanism is, is perhaps, you know, the way in which um, human beings have mistreated the natural world for the benefit of, well, for our own benefit through, through technolo uh, the technologicalization of, the, of, of working practices, et cetera. And so I think for me, the two things are fundamentally um, embedded, you know, that I do think um, from critical post-humanism, you get the ethogothic, and um, from echo gothic, it naturally leads to seeing the world in a, in a post humanist kind of way. So for me, those two things fundamental, and I think Re Rosie Bridotti talks very clearly about this. That that for her, you know, you can't have one without the other. You know that um, if you are a critical post humanist, you have to think in in ecological terms. I think. Yes, I. I... I think that the key word perhaps is embedded. Um, I was thinking, I think Alejandro has mentioned the fact that the, the monster is something that is inescapable. There is a, this idea in the comic that there is something that you simply cannot um, avoid. There's something that you need to, that actually you are part of some, some, you know, in a certain way. And I think that that's also what Paul was hinting at at the end of his presentation when he was talking about this idea of, um, of collapsing back into the universe, um, re-submerging re into, into the, the universe instead of, of um, trying to desperately cling on um, this separation. And I think that from a critical point of view, and that is something that has been reflected in popular culture, um, you cannot keep up all these barriers, all these boundaries, all these delimitations that used to um, circumscribe disciplines and, and uh, theoretical frameworks. And the same applies to the blurring of boundaries between ideas and protagonist and antagonist and the monster and the victim and the hero and the anti-hero in popular fiction, particularly in science fiction, to the point that I think the, the, the word in being embedded in the universe implies realizing that there is no, that the, everything is fluid and continuous, that we are on a continuum. And I think it's probably worth realizing one of the, I don't know if that's what you meant, Alejandro, but when you said um, that um, perhaps post-humanism as a philosophy is the solution, is, is trying to answer certain uh, problems. 
I think that one of the solutions is precisely stop thinking in terms of separation and boundaries and more in terms of connectivity, uh, relational networking and uh, decentralization of, of um, ontology to the point that you finally stop seeing the um, the way in which everything connects from a theoretical point of view and in the practical sense in in in, in the empirical experience of human lives that was yes and i i totally agree with well with with both with with paul and and, and amaya uh, and just to contribute uh to this conversation also to say that um the cyber and the eco um are are just the same thing uh are just matter and one can read even even non-cybernetical processes or not uh mechanistical processes uh that happen on earth uh and to an environmental level as also cybernetics or examples of cybernetic apply to organic uh, sort of um, processes or actions, and um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, with, with Paul and Amaya. Um, definitely, uh, we're living in in post human in post human times, but at the same time we have um, a, a, you know a techno capital that is trying to disrupt all these um, well all these relationships between between sorry for the binary between nature and human, but it's useful in this sense. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah, um, uh, the reason why I chose uh, to, to, to send this proposal to this panel uh, was just because of the, um, the traditional understanding of the field I work in, uh, accelerationism, uh, because it deals with um, cybernetics in a, in a very profound way. But other than that, I could have definitely sent it to to the eco Gothi as well, I guess. Yeah, th thank you, all of you. Go, go on, Amaya. I just wanted to briefly mention that it's so interesting what you just said, that they are basically the same thing. The eco part and then the cyber part of this construct that we are working with, everything is matter. From, again, going back to Bredotti's vitalist materialism, it is all matter to the point, I mean, I would ask the question, how can we think of a cyborg as something unnatural when it is produced, created, exists within the natural universe, the world? It's, there was only one that we know of and that we experience, okay? In, let's, let's be practical at this point. Let's just talk about the one that we experience to our senses. If we are natural beings and organic creatures, uh, are natural. How come at something that they produce becomes unnatural? It, I think it's philosophically, it, it's a paradox. And I think that's precisely what all of these TV series and this comic that I had no idea existed and so interesting are trying to conceptualize and realize as in visual, in visual terms for us. That was... Yeah, thank you. I think that's very interesting, especially what, what you said before also about the blurring of the boundaries, because this is also something that's come up in previous panels and discussions that um, in the how the modes that the Gothic creates nowadays in popular culture tend to blur these lines between the other and the monster and ourselves and all these things. So I think this is very interesting. And, and thank you so much, all of you, for your answers. Does any one of you want something more to that? Or do we have any more questions from the public? Last minute questions? No, I was just going to say, just maybe as a, just to add on to what Amaya said, just a final, well, my final thought, if you like that. I just kind of think, as, as Amaya said, kind of this movement um, towards kind of embeddedness, I kind of, I find it really interesting, you know, because I, I do think that one of the things that we've been talking about consistently in these panels about the Gothic is, is the other, you know, and that kind of the nature of othering, which is fundamental to the Gothic. And it's all based on fear, obviously, you know, we other because of what we fear. And I, I just kind of find critical posthumanism and, and, and hopefully what myself and, and Amaya are trying to look at posthuman technogothic as a way to kind of move beyond that fear, that actually kind of technology doesn't have to be fearful, it doesn't have to be othered, you know, that actually it's a way to be affirmative. 
and that you can kind of you know by destroying that sense of of the other you also remove the human's need to be fearful which are kind of you know it's a very affirmative kind of project that i think the gothic is actually moving towards you know i kind of think the gothic is interesting at the moment because it's not just about fear it's actually about trying to turn around that fear and and provide kind of things like axel was talking about you know you kind of critiquing um capitalism in in a kind of productive way you know to kind of show a, a possible uh, solution to that or an alternative you know so i think it's kind of we're, we're living in interesting gothic times because actually i think the gothic is now doing something perhaps slightly different than it than it has done historically yes and exactly that's what i find interesting like if you find technology if you fear technology then you tend to say let's escape to the, to nature but also in gothic narrative nature it's also sometimes feared so then where where do we go so that your proposition about moving beyond that fear that's very interesting so um i think we can close here and i want to give a final thank you to our panelists for their very very interesting work and also to our public today and if anyone from the public wants to join me and turn on their cameras to give a final thank you to our panelists they will be welcome so again thank you very much and it's been a pleasure <laughs>